Okay. So, today we're going to finish up uh, this relationship between these different variables uh, in, in relating to gas laws. So, yesterday we looked at the relationship between pressure and volume. Okay? So, when you looked at your data, so remember kind of what happened, is that you had this syringe, and you can change the volume, okay? So that's what you control. So you had yonder syringe like this, you set it to a certain value, and you were measuring in units called KPA, and that stands for kilopascals. Okay, and that's one of the many, many, many ways that you can measure pressure. And so, we're just gonna, you're going to need this later on to answer some of these questions on the next part. So, kind of the baseline that we use in chemistry is, a, is an atmosphere, is one atmosphere. Okay, so under standard conditions, okay, what we call STP, in chemistry, that's one atmosphere, and an STP, the temperature in gas laws is zero degrees Celsius, okay? Now, here's the problem with Celsius, or Fahrenheit, is that you can get values that are zero, and you get values that are negative numbers, which makes even less sense, because if you have negative temperatures, that could, cor it could correspond mathematically with negative pressure which, or negative volume, which doesn't make any sense, okay? Or if the temperature reaches zero, okay, it reaches zero. Or does that mean we don't have any volume? Do we not have any pressure? What do we have? So to do away with this, this is why, and remember this today when you're doing these conversions, when you're dealing with gas laws and chemistry, okay, your temperature has to be in Kelvin, okay? So it's a simple conversion. When you have temperature that's in, that's in Celsius, to get to Kelvin, you add 273 to it. So at stand, what we call standard temperature and pressure, one, you're at one atmosphere of pressure and you're at 273 Kelvin, okay? So like right now, Room temperature right now in this room is about 22 degrees Celsius. So at 22 degrees Celsius, that corresponds, if you take 22, it's the simplest conversion that exists in all of science. All you have to add is, all you, you don't have to multiply, all you have to do is add numbers together. So that becomes 5, 9, 295. So right now we're at about 295 Kelvin. So the basis of the Kelvin is named after Gordon Kelvin, British guy. So if you look on this graph, okay, in your packet on page 10, here was the basic idea, was that if you graph pressure and temperature, okay, and you extrapolate this line out, at some point, the pressure inside the container is gonna to go to zero. And I'll show you that in just a second how that works. So, basically when that line crosses zero, what happens on an atomic level, this measure of entropy, which is this measure of disorder, goes to zero. So in other words, there's no disorder in the system. Okay, so this is what we call absolute zero. It's, we, and you can't go below absolute zero, okay? That's like as cold as you can possibly go, and that's a 0, 0.000. And the coldest temperature we've ever really achieved has been like 0 0.01 Kelvin. And the, only, and the only way scientists were able to pull that off is they took a single, like, rubidium atom, and they trapped it in a laser. And by trapping it in a laser, it's just like they put it in a jail cell. And they said, okay, you can't go anywhere. So, so if you couldn't go anywhere, then there's no entropy and there's no disorder. 
So generally, so that's how you reach that point. As you, as you decrease the temperature, the volume becomes smaller, or the pressure becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. At some point, that if you extrapolate that line out, it's going to hit this x-axis. That's what we call absolute zero on the Kelvin scale. Okay. So the reason that we don't work in the Kelvin scale is just because the numbers are really big. Okay. It's like you're not going to say, hey, what's the temperature? Ah, 295. Okay. That's a lot of work. Okay. So that's why we work in Fahrenheit. That's why we work in Celsius because the numbers are a little bit easier to work with. But any time you do any mathematical work in gas laws, you listen to me. You have to work in Kelvin. You cannot work in Celsius. You cannot work in Fahrenheit. Okay? So if you're doing any mathematical calculations involving temperature in a chemistry or physics class, any science class, you have to be in Kelvin. Okay? All right. Now, so over, since you look up, Look on page 10. Let's go ahead and get, there's a chart in here that I want you, that we're going to just fill out together. So on that one, it's got that first line that says standard pressure. Okay? So standard pressure, just talked about in atmospheres, is 1.00. So right now we're at about one atmosphere of pressure. So that's equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, so what that means conceptually is that on every square inch of your body, there is about 14 pounds. Okay, 14 pounds is like a bowling ball. So right now on every square inch of your body, there is a pressure equivalent to 14 bowling balls. But that's, we're used to it, okay? That's a good thing because if we, if we lose that pressure, bad things happen, okay? you're literally like your blood would begin to boil, bad things are going to happen. We want that pressure. We're used to that pressure. We have to have that amount of pressure. So the next one is TOR, okay? So 14 PSI is the same as 760 TOR, okay? TOR is the one that's probably used the least, mainly because it's just nobody really measures in TOR, okay? But it's, it's a unit of measure. Then, then the next line down, you're going to have kilopascals. That's 101.3 kilopascals, okay? So Pascal's is named after Blaise Pascal, who was the French physicist who came up with this idea. So if you take physics, when we talk about gas laws, we're going to work in Pascal's because that works better with how we measure things in, in, in the physics system, okay? Then you got millimeters of mercury, that's 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's what we talked about yesterday because how they used to measure pressure is they had a tube in a pool of liquid mercury and standard temperature, they measured the height of the column and they said, oh, that's 760, that's a good even number, we'll call it that. So that's why we talked about yesterday. Pressure in a chemistry class has an identity crisis because there's so many different ways that you can measure pressure. Okay, you can measure it in pascals, kilopascals, inches of mercury, all this good stuff. Typically, in a, in a chemistry class, we're generally going to work off of atmospheres. Okay, that's generally the second one we'll work in is probably kilopascals. So that's what you all worked with yesterday. Okay. So make sure that you've got that. And then up there on that, that line up above where it says standard temperature, okay, make sure that that's zero degrees Celsius and 273 Kelvin, okay? So make sure you have those figured out because you're going to need that later on. Now, so on this practice down below while we're here, let's just kind of go through some of these. So on that practice, practice down below, you have 550 millimeters of mercury and you want to change that into kilopascals. So this is why we learned how to do conversions before we get into this. So it's a simple process. It's the same thing that you've done before. You're going to set up a conversion chart. You're going to go, oh, 
550 millimeters of mercury. So if I've got 550 millimeters of mercury here, I'm going to put millimeters of mercury there, just like mole conversions. Okay, it's the same idea. So I got 550 millimeters of mercury. I'm going to put millimeters of mercury down here. And you want to convert that into kilopascals. So then you go up to your chart and you say, oh, right, 760 millimeters of mercury is equivalent to 101.3 kilopascals. Okay, it's the same number. So you can do us a favor. Let's just do this all together. So take 550 times 101.3 and then divide that by 760. 73.309. So 73 point what? 309. So I call it 73.1, okay? Kilopascals. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully that makes sense because 760 is 101.3, so we only have 550, so our answer should be less than 101.3, which is what it is, okay? Now, the next one, you got 325 kilopascals. Okay, same idea. You're going to put kilopascals here. You're going to put atmospheres up here. So that's 101.3 is equal to exactly one atmosphere. Okay, now think this through. Is your answer going to be bigger or smaller than one atmosphere? Bigger. Bigger. I have more than 101.3, so therefore I'm going to have more than one atmosphere, okay? So that's how all of those are going to play out. Atmospheres, PSI, all those are just, they only have a couple left. Now, when you get down to number two on that practice, so it's using conversion factor to make the following temperature conversion. That's as easy as you can get. So on that first one, you have 26 degrees Celsius. Okay, come on. And you want to change that into Kelvin. So what are you going to do? What's the, what do you have to do? Add 273. add 273 to it. So you can take 26 and add 273 to it. 299. 299 Kelvin. Okay, so on that number two, you're either adding 273 or you're subtracting 273 okay that's an easy set of conversions okay so now that we have that let's back up the bus to page eight okay so hopefully what you all have on your graph when you graphed pressure and volume okay Hopefully you got this nice inverse relationship, okay? And there's a, there's a couple of ways you can think this through like conceptually, okay? If you like the second grade analogy, okay? As you make the room bigger and bigger and bigger, you're gonna have fewer and fewer collisions with the second graders, okay? Uh, it makes sense, right? Now. You, it's handy if you can conceptualize what has to happen for that pressure gauge to work, okay? So that pressure gauge works by particles hitting a sensor, okay? That's how it has to work. It works by those hitting a sensor. So if you keep that in mind and go, okay, well, the only way the pressure can drop is either you have, either you reduce the number of collisions Okay, or you have the same number of collisions, but the particles are moving slower. Okay, so that's an option. So obviously, if this apple is just moving really slowly when it hits the screen, versus if I throw it faster, so even though I might have the same number of collisions, if those collisions have more energy, that's going to be a higher pressure. Okay. If, or I could have more collisions and have higher pressure, which is really going to make, or you know, we're really going to make that pressure go up. So, if you can visualize what happens to create that reading on that pressure sensor, because it's going to be bouncing off, that sometimes helps you understand what's happening. 
So if you look at that first chart over there, okay? So now that you kind of have an idea of what's happening. So on this first one, I want to make sure everybody's cool with this. So you've got this chart, okay? And you've got initial, <coughs> final, and then the effect, okay? And you got pressure, temperature, volume, in, okay? So Luke, what does the end stand for? What's that a measure of? Let me give you a hint. Rhymes with umber. Number. Of? Of. Uh, yeah, particles. Okay? Particles. It's the number of particles that are in the system. If you're talking about a second grade class, it's how many kids, it's how many Timmies that you have. Okay? And so, unless I tell you differently, we're always going to keep the number of Timmies the same. So, that's just going to stay a constant. Okay? Nothing's going to happen there. Okay? We're not, because... If you look at what you all did yesterday with the syringe, you kept, you kept it hooked up to the pressure sensor, okay? You didn't change the number of kids that were inside the room, okay? That stayed as a constant. Now, what is temperature measure? L, what is temperature measure? Um, it'll... Yeah, how much energy the kids have, right? So yesterday, we didn't change the temperature. So the temperature stayed a constant, okay? So we didn't change the number of Skittles, we didn't change the energy of the system, and we didn't change the number of kids that we had in the room, okay? Those were staying constant. Now, if you look at this on the initial system, you were told that you had 1.3 atmospheres, and that was occupying 150 milliliters, okay? So that was my initial set of conditions. Boom, here we go. So then you're told, what's the pressure when the volume is increased to 190, okay? Now, what we did is that we increased the volume, okay? So we made that variable bigger. So just think this through. Let's actually fill in that effect on the bottom. So what do you think is going to happen to that pressure when I increase that volume? Decrease. decrease. Okay, so you think it's going to decrease. And that, and that bears witness to this graph. As that volume got bigger, the pressure became smaller. Okay, we've increased the size of the room. Same number of Timmies, same number of Skittles. We're just going to have fewer collisions. Okay, now mathematically, we got to figure that out. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to start with that 1.30 atmospheres. And you have one of two options. You can multiply it by 150 milliliters over 190 milliliters. Or you can take 1.3 atmospheres and multiply it by 190 milliliters over 150 milliliters. Okay? Those are your two options. Okay? Those are it. Those are your two options. So this is what you think through. And you go, okay, I have to have a smaller pressure. So which one am I going to choose? The first one or the second one? First one. Okay. So if you take 150 and divide it by 190, so there's a couple of things that are going to work out well. The milliliters are going to cancel out. Okay, because I still want to end up with atmospheres. So this is why you write down the units. Oh, the milliliters are going to cancel out because I'm taking milliliters and dividing it by milliliters. Then I'm going to multiply that by atmospheres. Okay, multiply by atmospheres, then I still get those same units. So if you do that, you get like 1.0. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. You said, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool, right? Volume went up. Pressure went down, okay? So that's what you're going to do on number two, okay? So on number two, you got 5.75 milliliters standard pressure, okay? Now, at this point, you kind of have to know, oh, okay, standard pressure. 
Then we're going to change that, that pressure is increased to 1.5 atmospheres. So on that chart, okay, so you've got your initial, final, and effect, right? So pressure, volume, or pressure, temperature, volume, in, okay? N's going to be constant, temperature's going to be constant. So now, they didn't specifically tell you in the problem what the initial pressure is, but they said it was standard conditions. So under standard conditions, what's my pressure? 1.0. Oh, okay, that's going to be 1.0. And that had a volume of 5.75. <clears throat> now, in this situation, we're going to increase that atmospheric pressure to 1.5. So we're going to increase our pressure. So now if we increase the pressure, what has to happen to the volume? Increase. Increase or decrease? Decrease. Yeah, it's going to go down. So I know this has to go down. So again, now here's the situation. You're going to take that 5.75 milliliters, okay? And again, you have a choice. You can either multiply that by one atmosphere divided by, oh, come on, 1.5 atmospheres, okay? Or you can take 5.75 and multiply it by 1.5 over 1. Which one are you going to pick? 1 over 1.5 or 1.5 over 1? Izzy, which one are you going to pick? Uh, 1 over 1.5. Why? Because you want a smaller number. There you go. Okay? You see the process. Okay? And then number three plays out the same way. Okay? You got flexible container. You got a pressure of 750 millimeters of mercury. What's the pressure when the volume is decreased to four? Okay? So it's the same idea. It's you just decide what you're going to do. Got that idea. Okay, now let's talk about temperature, okay? So what I have here, It's a very, very, very well insulated container. And within this, I have liquid nitrogen. Okay? So take this. Pour some of this out. Okay? So basically, to make liquid nitrogen, and liquid nitrogen is what, what makes up most of the, the atmosphere. So nitrogen molecules aren't very sticky, okay, which is why they exist as a gas. So if you want to get liquid nitrogen, you've got to take those nitrogen molecules that are moving around, and you have to get them really, 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 really cold. Okay, so it's, 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 this is where it's a great analogy with second graders out on the playground. Okay, so on a typical day, the second graders aren't going to stick together. Okay, they have too much energy. But if you get those, if you take that second grade class on a really, 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 really cold day, those second graders are going to tend to huddle up together. They're going to stick together. Okay? That's what we have to do to make liquid nitrogen. So we took that liquid nit we took nitrogen, we got air basically, and we chilled it way, 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 way down until those particles lost so much energy that they began to stick together. So it's kind of cool, so if you like, pour it out on the table. It kind of like dances around on, you see little bits of the liquid nitrogen floating around on the table. So, and you can just feel like that 
cold as it falls. Take this balloon. Now, what do you think is going to happen to the volume of the balloon? Decrease. Why? Because I can see it getting smaller. But why is it decreasing? <laughs> think, think of the second graders. What are the second graders doing? They're huddling up, right? Okay. So we're making the second graders. How do I? So, think about this. What am I doing to the temperature inside the balloon? Is the temperature going up or is the temperature going down? Temperature is dropping like a rock, right? So, as that temperature drops like a rock, what's happening to the volume? Volume is becoming. Bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller. Okay? Okay? Now, so we've got these. Now, so as they warm up. Oh my God. <laughs> So as it warms up, what's happening to the volume? Increasing. It's increasing. There, it got better. So take another one out. So that's how it came out. Pass it. Huh? No. Don't do that. So what's happening inside of there, what are the second graders doing? They're getting, yeah, away. They're getting more energy. So as they get more energy, they're expanding that volume. So then we'll do the last one in here. That one got really flat. Because that was that first one that I put in there. Yes, now they can see it. Okay. Smells like Kool Aid. And now we're back to that normal size. Oh, wow. Look at you. Look at you. Okay. Now, what you're going to do in the lab, okay? So you're going to change up, we're going to change up a little bit. So what we're going to do is that this now, what I just showed you was the relationship between temperature and volume, okay? The lab that you're going to do is actually going to look at the relationship between temperature and pressure, but it's going to be the same idea, okay? So what do you think happened to the pressure inside those balloons when I, when I chilled it down? Pressure go up, pressure go down. Down. Why? Grace, why? Why do you think the pressure went down? Um, because they're not hitting the outside as fast. There you go. Yeah, they're, 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 they've chilled out. They're, if, if I'm teaching the second grade class and it's really, really cold outside, those second graders aren't hitting my legs as much. Okay? So, over here, 
on page. That. Ah, page nine. Okay, so look at page nine. So here's what you're going to do on page nine. So this is going to require a little bit of technique, different than what you did yesterday. So what you're going to do is that you're going to have, you're still going to use the pressure sensors like you did yesterday, but here's going to be what's going to be different. So you need the pressure sensor just like you had before. Okay, that's going to be the same. You're going to plug that into the lab quest just like you all did yesterday. But this time, you're going to use a test tube, okay, specific to this size, and I've got them in there. And then you're going to use this piece of hose that has a rubber stopper on it that you can put in here. So the first thing that you want to do is you're going to get this hooked up, okay, make sure that's securely in there. And this end here is going to twist onto the end of that pressure sensor, okay? So you're going to have a setup like this, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to look at three different temperatures. So over here on page nine, okay, you've got this quantitative data column. So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at, we're going to put temperature, and then we're going to put pressure, okay? So we're going to, the first one is going to be room temperature. So I'm also going to have temperature probes over there. So what, on the lab quest, you're going to plug in two different things. You're going to plug in the pressure sensor, and then you're also going to plug in the temperature. So what you'll see is that you'll see a split screen. One side is going to be measuring temperature, and the other side is going to be measuring the pressure. Okay, so you're going to see two different displays. So the first one you're going to do is room temperature. You're just going to plug that in. It's going to say probably, I'm guessing, something around like 22 degrees, okay? And then whatever that pressure is. So just hook it up, measure the room temperature. Here we go, we're off to the races. Okay, so that's going to be our baseline. Now, what, about, what we want to do is we want to warm it up and we want to cool it down. So over there, I'm going to give you a big beaker and I've got a cooler, over, a, a styrofoam cooler, and there's a bunch of ice water in there. So what you want to do is take that beaker, we're going to fill it up with ice water, and then what I want you to do is I want to take and do not break the seal. This is like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Don't crop, don't break the seal, okay? So you're going to take this, you're going to put that inside. Imagine this is that beaker of ice water. You're going to put that in there, and then you're going to take your temperature probe, and you're going to put the temperature probe in there. Now, you need to let this sit in there for probably three or four minutes so that that temperature can cool down inside the tube. So... First thing you do, measure your room temperature one. Don't do anything first. Do, do the room temperature one. I'm going to give you, we're going to get a beaker full of ice water. Take this, put that, do not let that ice water go over the top of this. So you want to have that, about this much of that below the ice water. You're going to have to hold it down in there because it's, it's buoyant and it's going to like rise up out of it. So you're going to have to hold that in there, okay? Hold it in there for about three or four minutes. You're gonna, then you're going to have the temperature of the ice water. So within this container, you're going to have two things. You're going to have the test tube, and then you're going to have the temperature probe. You're going to have two things in there, okay? You can have that number. The next thing that you need to do after you've done that, that needs to sit there for about three or four minutes, okay? When you get, get done with that, pour the ice water out. You can just pour it down the sink. Okay? I don't need it back. Pour that ice water out. Then what you want to do is take that beaker and then fill it up to about that same amount of water and then put it on the hot plate and then we're going to heat up that water, okay? So then we're going to heat up that water and then we're going to do the same thing. You're going to take this and you're going to put that inside that beaker of hot water. It's technically known as, as a hot water bath, okay? 
So when you what you do with a hot water bath, it's pretty simple. You take a beaker, you fill it up with water, you put it on a hot plate, and we're going to use that water to heat up what's inside the test tube. So let that warm up for, you know, you don't have to get it to boiling, okay? Just maybe get that temperature up to maybe like 60, 70 degrees. So once that temperature in that beaker hits 60 to 70 degrees, record what the pressure is inside of here and you're done. So you're gonna have three different temperatures. What? Oh. Just use a Clorox wipe. So you don't have to make that water boil, okay? We don't need to let it go for that long, okay? Like I said, just maybe get 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. Now, but just so you get used to it, go ahead and change those temperatures to Kelvin, okay? So to change that to Kelvin, all you do is 273. Huh? What was this? Nothing. Okay, so when you're recording those temperatures, go ahead and change those into Kelvin so you get used to it. So 22, add 273 to it, you're at 295, okay? Just so you got that. So then what you're going to do is that you're going to draw a graph over here, and you're going to have pressure... here and you're going to have temperature here okay but make sure that that temperature is in kelvin now here's a little trick that you can do because that your temperatures in kelvin are going to be really really big numbers so what you can do is start that at like zero zero and then what you can do i don't know if if, if other teachers have shown you this technique but then what you can do is put like these little squiggly lines that says, hey, here's a break in all of this data, okay? <clears throat> and then, then you can start, and, make, and then this is where you're going to have to look at the scale and see what you've got. So let's say you get that down to like zero. Okay, zero is like 273. So what you might do is go from 270 up to, so what you might do is something, start like at 270, and then go up to however high that you need to go. That way it alleviates all of this blank space between zero and 270. So in this situation, because you're gonna have such a big gap in the data, you're not gonna have any temperatures below that. So it's, a, it's just, a, everybody recognizes this. The, these little lines here indicate we have a break and that we have huge chunks of data that we're, numbers that we're not gonna graph. So that's why you put those there. Then you can start at 270 or whatever, however you want to go from there. Pressure, that's going to be in kilopascals, okay? And again, you're just going to have to look at what your pressure is based upon those numbers. Cool with that, okay? So you're going to have three different measurements. Now, when you're heating up something, and this is just a general technique, when you're heating up a solution and you're going to have it on the hot plate don't let that temperature probe rest on the bottom of that beaker because then what you're measuring is the temperature at the bottom of the beaker okay you want to measure the temperature of the water that's in it so actually what you can do is take that temperature probe it's a stainless steel probe and just kind of mix that up a little bit that way you're going to get like a good mixing of that water so when you're measuring your temperature don't let that temperature probe rest on the bottom okay because you're getting a false reading you're measuring basically the temperature of the hot plate you want to measure the temperature of the water that's above it. and remember like Ella said when you're measuring temperature you're measuring the skittles so as you increase as you put if you have that in ice bath 
you're taking away the Skittles. When you put it on the hot plate, you've given them Skittles. Okay? Got that. So, what I want done for tomorrow, because basically I'm trying to use. So, you want, we basically pretty much figured out all of page 10. Okay, you just need to finish those temperature conversions at the bottom. And then do uh, these calculations on page 11 and through this middle of page 12. So you want to get through the middle of page 12 for tomorrow. Okay? So you're going to have a graph, get through the middle of page 12. We're good? Ready, break? Let's go. So stop that. Sorry.